everybody. If you can't hear me in the back, do shout out and let me know and I will try to shout a little bit louder. Well, better still, if you can't, you know, come up please, because there are seats up in the front. Okay. Indeed, and this is a, a heavily illustrated talk, so if you can see the screen, that's all the better. There's a phone going on. There's someone's alarm. There's an alarm going on. Someone's even guilty this time. And it's in this area. Yeah. Where are we going? Before I start properly, I'm just going to say that most of the pictures I'm going to use today are from the 1890s up until the 1920s with a few modern ones in between. But the vast majority of them are from the 1890s, as close to Hopkins' time in Munster as they could make it. Do we need to bounce Somebody needs to check their phone. Somebody needs to check their phone. Right away. Is that how they do it? Is it on someone's phone? Are you sure it's a phone? Could it be something else? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a probably no. some parts of the house. I think it's something. It could be a pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Follow the sound. Follow the sound. I can't. I tried it. I'm not able to follow. No, we all settle down. Yeah. Okay. Barry, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance here this morning, and I'd like to thank the Hopkins Society, the committee of the Hopkins Society, especially, for inviting me. And now I'm going to alarm them because I'm going to tell you that this is not a talk about Mandy Hopkins. It is not a talk about Jared Manley Hopkins. Having said that, because I'm surrounded by experts and enthusiasts on Hopkins the poet, uh, I can claim to be neither. But I can claim to be, and I only make a claim, that I am an expert on Munstreven and an enthusiast for its history. And I love to promote Munstreven's huge history whenever I get the chance. And I'm very grateful to the committee for allowing me today. <coughs> Now, um, what I hope to do is paint uh, a picture of Munstreven in Hopkins' time between about 1886 and 1889. Hopkins, to do that though, I have to go back and start with a bit of earlier history. And Hopkins himself has helped me because he summarised the major points of Munstreven's history in his letter of April 1889 to Robert Bridges when he said, St. Evan founded a monastery, a singular story is told of him. Henry VIII confiscated it, and it became the property of Lord Drahda. The usual curse on Abbey lands attends it, and it never passes down the direct line. The present Lord and Lady Drahda have no issue. Outside Moor Abbey, which is a beautiful park, the country is flat, bogs and rivers and canals. The river is the Barrow, which, in the, Irish, which the Irish poets call the Dun Barrow, I call it the Burling Barrow Brown. Both descriptions are true. Lord Rahna and the domain here in Morabi we will talk about later. Uh, but the, uh, the singular story of St. Devon, which Hopkins does not expand on, is intimately bound up with that Burling Barrow Brown. The Barrow in ancient times marked a boundary between the men of Leinster and the men of the Midlands of Ireland. Uh, within the precincts of the town, there are several fording points, uh, where the Dunbarrow is slack and shallow enough to allow people to cross. These fording points today are marked by the aqueduct and the various road bridges and the uh, rail bridges as well. The a ma major route of ancient Ireland, the Slidala, which was one of the highways between Limerick and Ro the seat of Royal Tara, actually passes through the town on a line there, passing about where the uh, railway bridge crosses today. So it was a major border point, a major interface between two peoples. And the monastery that Hopkins believed was founded by St. Evan was probably founded by St. Evan in about the 6th century. St. Evan was St. Evan's mentor, and Evan inherited the monastery from him. And he brought with him uh, people uh, from the province of Munster, because he was a prince of Cashel. 
and the monks he brought with him were Munster men as well. And they settled here in the borderland between the Kingdom of Offaly and the Kingdom of Leinster. And the singular story that Hopkins mentions is probably how St. Evan uh, saved the life of the King of Offaly, Bramu Falia, uh, and many of his senior quarters during a great plague that was sweeping through Ireland by laying down his life and the life of 12 of his senior monks in debt for um, the king and his courtiers so that they could survive the plague. Uh, in return, the king of Offaly made Munistreven a place of singular sanctuary throughout the land. And all this is recorded in an early Irish writing called the Cain Evan, or the Rule of St. Evan. He was also, St. Evan, was also one of the authors of the Tripartite Life of St. Patrick, another great manuscript of early medieval Ireland. And it's no wonder, therefore, that Hopkins felt, felt, felt this special affinity for the landscape which was the sanctuary of a fellow cleric and author. St. Evan's Monastery died out about the 10th <coughs> century, uh, and a new foundation by the Cistercians in the area down here off the picture, where we are now in Morabi, was um, founded under the patronage of the Odempses in 1189. And basically, that side of the river was Odempsey land, and this side of the river was borderland or controversy land uh, abutting the Pale of Dublin, which stretched at times as far as to Kildare, but <coughs> mainly around the county of Dublin. The abbots of Munistreven uh, were experts in treading this borderland existence between the native Irish on that side of the river and the English of the Pale on that side of the river. Uh, the English of the Pale were often in dispute with the abbots of Munistreven for granting sanctuary to Irish rebels as they saw it. As Hopkins notes, the dissolution of the Irish monasteries by Henry VIII, uh, the, because of that, the lands eventually became the seat of the Earls of Drogheda and here in Moravia. It was, however, the sixth Earl and the first Marquis of Drogheda who uh, built the town as we saw, see it today, with its wide parallel streets, its fine garden houses, and the Grand Canal, which was, was such a boon to the distillery <coughs> of the properties, uh, through, and allowed it to flourish. Indeed, indeed, the town we see it today is little changed in structure from the town that Hopkins would have experienced on his first visit here at Christmas 1886. Let's therefore join Gerard Manley Hopkins on his first trip to Munistreven uh, at the invitation, probably at the invitation, of James Cassidy, who was the wealthy, a wealthy Catholic distiller of the town. He would have started out from his apartments at 85 and 86 St. Stephen's Green and gone to Kingsbridge Station, which is now Houston Station, as you all know it, where he would have boarded one of the dark port delivery coaches of the Great Southern and Western Railway Com Company and started his journey to Monastreven, where he would have arrived after about two hours at this station. This is Monastreven Station in 1890. Um, it was built in 1847 by the Great Southern Western Railway Company, and 14 men were employed here, uh, where at least three passenger trains each way stopped each day. Mail trains also went through here, and the mail train never stopped. So it collected the mail bags, which were large leather satchels, by taking them off a hook at high speed as they passed through the station. <coughs> and this is the method that Hopkins' letters from Munistreven would have ultimately gone to the GPO in Dublin, and from there to Bridges and his mother. Uh, once a week, train from the Guinness Distillery in James's Gate arrived, full of the products of brewing, the roast grains, barley and hops that were no longer needed. Uh, they were a byproduct of the distilling of Guinness's porter and they were used for uh, feed for livestock. 
Livestock were also very important in this area. Uh, cattle were loaded from pens on the far side of the station and sent to the markets in Dublin. Uh, after Hopkins disembarked the train and collected his luggage, the same train would have headed for Limerick across this bridge. This is the uh, bridge known as the Metal Bridge locally. Uh, these same pillars still carry a modern bridge across the barrow at this point, but this particular lattice work bridge is very indicative of and shows how much an industrial site uh, Monastreven was in this late Victorian period. It was uh, an industrial town in a very agricultural re region. <coughs> Uh, on that first occasion, having met Mr. James Cassidy or some of his servants to collect him at the station, uh, Hopkins would have encountered other industrial parts of Monastreven. Now, uh, this is not a very clear picture, but have blown it up from the 1920s. And the first thing he would have done coming out this gate, he would have encountered a malt house. And the malt houses were part of the supporting industry of the distillery in the, in the area. Uh, the malting process takes grain in from the countryside, soaks it for hours, uh, the grain swells up and it has then starts to sprout. It is then drained and dried in a malt house such as this. There are distinctive square buildings with uh, two stories. On the upper story, the grain was stored and raked out and dried where it became maltose, which was uh, a sugary product that was used in the distillation and brewing process. And it's one of many industries that depended on the Cassidy's. This area is called Canal Harbour, and it was much of, sorry, these are some of uh, the, the malt house workers in the area. This is from Daly's Malt House in 1900, but very indicative of the kind of Monstrelin people that Hopkins would have been encountering. The Grand Hop Canal is much, a much older part of Monstrelin's industrial heritage. And uh, it w arrived in Monstrelin in 1786 to join the Baronevic navigation with the Port of Dublin and the Shannon River. It was a major boon to the then recently established distillery of Mr. John Cassidy and carried the majority of the produce of both the distillery and the brewery for the next 120 years. Originally the canal uh, entered the barrow here by means of a set of locks down one bank of the river, crossed the river and went up the other bank by another set of locks where it carried on to a tie and entered the Baron of <coughs> And later another branch to Mount Melik was initiated but failed economically. It was therefore a natural place to build a harbour and this is the Canal Harbour here. Uh, the Canal Harbour had docks, three uh, great three-storey warehouses for the loading and unloading of goods workshops and a hotel for the crews of the barges. It was also an area for the discharge of coal and that gave it its name of the bell yard. Uh, bellmen, you might know, are people who transport coal. And a bell is also a scoop for taking coal out of one of these barges, as you see here. You can also see the cranes. And you might notice this bridge here, which is the Crow Bridge. And that led into the uh, Back Canal, which is today filled in, but um, once passed down the back of the houses at West End and extended as far as Whelan's Row. And if you study this six inch map, which is from um, the 1840s, you might be able to see that the original intention seems to have been to take the canal, the back canal, all the way as far as Monastreven House, which is a feature of our talk today. Um, by the time that Hopkins had visited in 1886, the Grand Canal uh, was... Sorry, I've lost my place. 
Um, <clears throat> By the time Hopkins um, arrived in 1886, the, the canal no longer featured hot horse-drawn transport. The canal barges were driven by engines, but it was still a major source of transport uh, for the region. It carried much more cargo at this time than the railway did, and the majority of the products of Cassidy's distillery and brewery went to Dublin um, by canal barge. And it remained a viable source of transport right up to the 1960s. Hopkins and Cassidy would have, have next turned into uh, Drogheda Street, where they would have come upon an enclave of uh, Catholic clergy and religious. Uh, on the top of Drogheda Street, we will, would find the Christian Brothers House, the National School and the house of Dr. Uh, Comfort, who, which was later, uh, just after Hopkins' time, became the Convent of Mercy. They would have also paused to look at the chapel of St. Peter and Paul here, naturally. The chapel of the Church of St. Peter and Paul's Monastery would naturally have attracted Hopkins' eye on his way past uh, towards. Monastreven House. Construction began at the same time as the railway station in 1847 uh, and was in the same limestone which Norman, I think, refers in his biography as an ugly white, but I might argue with him on that. <laughs> it replaced an earlier chapel which was on the other side of the canal uh, in Passlands, um, which was on land donated by the Earl of Drogheda. This is a good place perhaps to character of the people of Monastreven, and I do so with caution because I can see some of my neighbours here. <laughs> now, Monastreven has always been an interface in a borderland, and the process of anglicisation here, after the dissolution of the monasteries uh, and the, town, the town's fortunes became intrinsically linked with the government in Dublin and the Crown. So by the 1790s, Monastreven was home to the only Orange Order, Order Lodge in County Kildare. And the, it was the only town in the county to withstand the United Irish Rebels in 1798. The Monastreven Yeomanry here were main, a mainly Protestant militia, but a growing number of upwardly mobile Catholics had also taken up arms as loyal defenders of the town. By 1837, when John O'Donovan of the Arden Survey of Ireland uh, arrived in Monastreven to question the people as to the history of the place and the folklore of the place, he was able to say this. <coughs> I visited Monastreven yesterday but could find no feature or tradition there to throw any light on its history. The people are entirely anglicised and have lost all their ancient traditions. I long to get to Connacht again and the people of my own province because these are not only exceedingly ignorant of the subject of my inquiries, but also boorish and unobliging. <laughs> I hope none of our visitors here today find us that way still. But it does perhaps give some insight into Hopkins' letter of the 20th, 25th of December, 1887, on the Weeble family, where he says, these three young Weebles rejoice in the names of Tristram, Ursula, Leo. They are half English, half Irish, and their nationality is just divided. Outwardly or in the body, they are almost pure, paddy and biddy. Inwardly, they are of a mind mainly of John Bull. It was the new class of anglicised and upwardly mobile Catholics that caused this new church to be built. And it's worth reflecting that the period of building from 1845, when building commenced, 1847 parallels exactly the worst years of the Great Famine in Ireland, in other parts of the country, I might add. Uh, on the left, you can see the church as it was envisaged by its architect, William Dean Butler. And on the right, we see what Hopkins would have seen in a photo of about 1890, just, just after Hopkins had died. Uh, the reason these ornate spires were never 
uh, finish is not known. However, the opinions that uh, they either ran out of money or were forced to leave it at that height because it couldn't be higher than the spire of St. John's Church of Ireland, uh, the other church in town, are probably not true. I'm actually related to some of the builders, the, the Harris family that, that built it, and I favour the story that as they built these towers, they found that the architect had not allowed a deep enough foundation to support the growing weight of the spires. William Dean Butler was a very famous architect of Irish origin and actually built, visited and built buildings of great uh, architectural beauty in 19 countries around the world. But several of his churches uh, were designed with spires but ended up without them. I think he was a little bit bad on the maths of weight and mass. Um, <coughs> On one visit to Munistraven, Hopkins assisted Dr. Comanpert as the parish priest in the uh, Office of Communion during the busy Christmas Masses. Now, would you all like to see the interior of the church as Hopkins saw it? Yes. There we have the interior of St. Peter and Paul's in about 1890 on a Palm Sunday. In his letter of the 25th of December 1887, he said, I assisted the parish priest, who is recovering from a dangerous sickness, in giving communion this morning. Many hundreds came to the rail, which was, and with the unfailing devotion of the Irish, whose religion hangs uh, suspended over their politics as a blue sky over the earth, both in one landscape, but immeasurably remote and without contact or interference. This phenomenon happens particularly marked in Monastreven. Now, I've enhanced some of the details here, uh, and you can see the very ornate and very high Gothic ornamentation of the church at that period. Uh, on the left, you can see the, uh, the pulpit and the side altar dedicated to the Sacred Heart. While on the right, you can see the side altar dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. Both these side altars were sponsor sponsored by the, Cass the Cassidy family. You can also see the painted Victorian decoration around all the windows and the walls. If you go and visit the church later, you'll see that it's very plainly decorated today. But you'll also see the decoration around the arch, which uh, contains the Latin phrase how, in translation, it comes out as, how fearsome is the place, it is none other than the house of God. And here's the main altar, and you can see, hopefully, why I can say that this is Palm Sunday, because on either side of the altar, there are two palm trees in pots <coughs> for the special occasion. Um, in Hopkins' letter, he refers to the communion rail, and I hope you can see in this photo there are two communion rails, one here and one down here. The, you should be able to see both rails. At the sanctuary, the inner one here, is the, an Italian Baroque marble altar rail, which was installed by Father Comfort, who Hopkins knew, and it dates from 1712, and came from a monastery in Italy via the garden of the Adair family of Rat Adair House in County Leash, the famous or infamous Jack Adair. It's still there today, but not there today is this wooden altar rail, which is probably the rail that uh, Hopkins was referring to when he was talking about giving the communion to the ordinary people of Monastrevan. Uh, this was a wooden rail which divided the top one third of the church off for the quality of Munistrevan, who entered through a side door off Mary's Lane here and entered the, their own benches that they leased from the parish. The rest of the parishioners stayed in the nave of the church and you'll be able to see that the pulpit that we see here on the side uh, was in the body of the church, which is 
rather unusual. Usually pulpits are placed on the altar, or next to the altar, or in the sanctuary. The pulpit that we can see here between the two rails was erected to the memory of Father Joseph Farrell, who had died the year before Hopkins visited in 1885. Its placement meant that the ordinary people in the nave were preached at, while the quality of the parish sat with their backs to the parish priest. <laughs> However, on this first visit, uh, accompanied by James Cassidy, he would, Hopkins would have continued uh, from, from Drapa Street into Whedon's Row, which is named for a gunner at the Battle of Trafalgar, who came back and invested in property. And then past the RIC station here, which is now our community centre. Uh, they would have also passed Toker House, which is just up there, which was James Cassidy's own mansion. So passing on to Main Street, they would have passed the RIC barracks, which is, is this one here. Uh, and at this point, what I can say about the RIC barracks is that there was a sergeant living in the barracks with his family and four to eight constables as well. And their duties around the town were the usual policing, uh, keeping public order, keeping the king's peace, things like that. But also all sorts of things that we associate with um, local government now, such as dog licenses, registration of carts, things like that. There were more than 60 buildings along Main Street, and this is Main Street in the 1890s. Uh, there were 60 buildings between West End, which is that end of the street, and the Market Square, which comes out down the far end, just off the phone. Those included, um, as well as the private dwe dwellings, a lodging house, five public houses, a victualler, several drapers, grocers, a bootmaker's factory or shop, uh, a tea shop, and the Hibernian Bank, which is the large building that you can see just at the end of the photo. There was also the Methodist Church, which is tucked in there, and St. John's, which <laughs> starts about there. Now, the width of the street is something worth remarking on, and it recalls um, something of what Norman was saying about Hopkins and his fascination with militarism and the, the military life. Charles Moore, 6th Earl and 1st Marquess of Drogheda, uh, had laid out the town as we see it there and planned it in the 1780s. And he included this long, wide main street because among the many titles he had was Colonel of the 18th Hussars, a regiment of cavalry in the British uh, Army. And this street just happens to be wide enough that a regiment of cavalry can parade down it by troops. And it's wide enough to take a troop of 60 horse across, riding down. It also makes for a very unique town because we have the fine Georgian buildings fronting onto the main street and their front gardens sweeping down across the road down to the barrow. It's very unusual and makes for a very beautiful town. Now the principal residence in Main Street was, you can, you can almost make it out just there, Munnestreven House. Monastreven House was a fine Georgian Palladian house with a touch of grandeur of an earlier century which Hopkins thought had faded from Dublin. From the 1780s, it had originally been the home of the Reverend Walter Baggett, a Church of Ireland rector of the parish. He died in 1815, but he had a very large family. A relative of the Reverend Baggett, Captain Baggett, had led the Monastreven Yeomanry in 1798, and the house had become the headquarters for the regular army when they came into the county to uh, re uh, repress the rebellion in 1798. And it was here in June 1798 
that the arrest of Father Prendergast was plotted by one Lord Pirali, the controller of the Secret Service Fund for Ireland, at a dinner party at which, at which Mr. John Cassidy was present. Although John Cassidy was a magistrate and the folklore of the town says he was responsible for the uh, death of Father Prendergast, it's prob more probable that he was tried by court martial, which would have been staffed by military officers. The Cassidy family themselves moved from Grove House just inside the gates of Moor Abbey here uh, around 1854 and moved in to Munnestreven House. By 1870, James Cassidy had provided himself with a modern mansion in Toker House, uh, which was just happened to be right beside the parish church. Uh, he left Munnestreven House here to his sisters, Mary, Eleanor, and Frances Anne. Mary and Frances Anne were unmarried. Eleanor had married a man by the rejoicing in the name of Daniel O'Connell Weevil, who was uh, responsible for Cassidy's brewery. Mary Cassidy seems to have been Hopkins' primary host and the Miss Cassidy of his letters. And I'll quote again, in April 1889, uh, Hopkins wrote, who is Miss Cassidy? She is an elderly lady who by, who by often asking me down to Monastreven and by the change and holiday her kind hospita hospitality <coughs> provides is become one of the props and struts of my existence. After Mary's death in 1896, Frances Anne, although the younger of the Cassidy sisters, became the head of the household and the Miss Cassidy of Monastreven. The house itself was considered to be of the first quality and had 24 rooms and five servants. In the closest census to Hopkins' time, the 1901 census, these were Anne Montgomery, the cook, Mary Dunn, a housemaid, Mary Ann Fitzpatrick, the kitchen maid, John Anderson, the groom, and John Foster, the gardener. Aside from the two young maids, this is probably the staff which were present and looking after Hopkins during his stays in Monastreven House. Among the 24 rooms, rooms were an oratory where Hopkins said mass for the family. My father relates a little story of his own that while walking down Main Street one day with his grandfather, he passed Munnestreven House and blessed himself. And his grandfather looked at him and said, why are you doing that? He says, well, the Christian brothers taught me whenever I pass somewhere that the Blessed Sacrament is, I have to bless myself. And my, his grandfather looked at him and said, there was never anything in there except the devil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you have to remember that the Cassidy's were a strata above the rest of the people of Munnestreven and considered themselves thus as well. Miss Cassidy and Miss Weeble, though, were very involved in the local community and along with the Countess of Drogheda, they were active in promoting things like lace making which was hoped to be a cottage industry that would be, bring in income for women of the town. And Miss Weeble in particular uh, was instrumental in designing the kinds of lace patterns that were to be produced by the, the women of the town. And it was quite successful. Uh, these pieces of lace were sold to the fashion industry in London and Paris. Miss Frances Anne Cassidy died on the 27th of December 2015, age 78, and was interred in the Cassidy Mausoleum in Pastland Cemetery. Afterwards, Patmon's Reven House became home to another of the Cassidy widows, Kathleen Mary Josephine Uniac, or simply to the people of the town, Madam Uniac, or Madam. She was the widow of a British Army officer who had died in Africa and she's remembered as a very grand lady who kept a French companion and drove around town in a very fine horse and trap. But by the time of Madame Uniac's death, when she passed away in the 1950s, Cassidy's distillery and the Cassidy Farkin were 30 years in the past. And Madame Uniac was also interned in the Cassidy Mausoleum in Pastlands, but is not recorded on any headstone or marker. 
my grandfather was a local auctioneer and he was commissioned to dispose of the contents of the house in 1956. And my father tells the story of going around the house and bundling up all the books in the library with string in bundles of five or ten books, whatever, whatever was there. These bundles were put up for auction and like a plague of locusts, the book dealers and antique dealers of Dublin came down and descended on the auction, bought these bundles of books, went outside on the street there, cut the string and took away whatever single book they wanted from the bundle. So I have here today a number of books that actually survived um, from the Cassidy Library. This is John Cassidy's Statements of the Penal Laws, a legal thesis with his own notes in his own hand and his own book plate. John Cassidy, of course, as a Catholic and a successful businessman, needed to know the law. And it was one reason why the Cassidys became justices of the peace and magistrates in the locality. Because obviously it's better to be on the side of the crown rather than uh, opposed to the crown. Also, we have here the Aran Islands by J.M. Singh, illustrated by Jack B. Yates. And if I can show you one of the illustrations, this is the 1906 first edition. I don't know how this was left behind, but it was left behind. And this is Madame Muniac, Kathleen Muniac's book with, again, an embossed plate showing that it was part of the Munistraven House Library. Uh, of course, Yates, the Jack Yates of the illustrations, was a person that uh, Hopkins himself had known. Also, from um, the earlier lecture, we heard about uh, Punch magazine, and there were many, many bound copies of Punch magazine in the library of um, Munistraven House. And you can see there are some of the political cartoons of the time. This one is from, I think, 1855 or 58, 58. And so Hopkins might have been perusing these at the time. There were also many copies of Dickens's periodical all the year round. And also on the Marshall team, many bound copies of a, a magazine, an imperial magazine, and a very imperialistic magazine of the time called The Regiment, which by the 1900s was reporting all about the Boer War, and the Second Boer War at that, that point. So let's continue with our preambulations around Monastreven with Hopkins. He would have come out the front door of Monastreven House, down the steps, and turned left and headed down Main Street. So, as we approach the square, <coughs> it strikes me that one of the most important aspects of Hopkins in one seven are his letters. And that led to me to ask a question while I was preparing this uh, lecture, uh, where was the post office? Um, now, the best I can do is make an educated guess because the job of postmaster or postmistress was a franchise which was, often used, which was often taken by some of the publicans in the town. And we have many pubs and had many pubs, so it's hard to uh, track down who exactly was postmaster or postmistress at the time. But what I can say is that the post office has always been in the hands of some of the oldest families in Monastreven. In about 1847, it was in the hands of the Morgans, and by 1911, it was in the hands of the Catherine Story of Story's Pub, now the Bell Yard on Dublin Street. But it was for many years in the um, hands of the family of Harrisons and Stories, and operated out of this building, which is Duffy's today. Uh, you might look for later the <coughs> little section of cut out wall there where, which was the shop and the post office and make sure to have a look on the wall as well for the thermometer which you see here. Um, I'll talk about the thermometer in just a moment but uh, what would have happened what was that Hopkins or one of the servants would have come down the path, gone into the post office and posted the letters there. They would have been placed in one of these uh, um, mail cabs or um, jogging cars 
in the central well there, taken up to the railway station, placed in the satchel, hung on the hook, and the express train coming through would have taken them off and brought them to the GPO in Dublin. From the GPO, they were sent to the mail ship or mail boat, either from the docks in Dublin or Kingstown, which is now Dunleary. And they would have arrived with Hopkins's friend Bridges or his mother uh, in England within perhaps 24 hours. The system was so good at this stage. Of course, the whole empire at that stage ran on the British Postal Service. But <coughs> one of the other items that um, the post office would have provided, as well as the stamps and sealing wax and string, was ink. And this thermometer is one of the surviving parts of the post office. It promotes Stevens's ink for all temperatures <coughs> with the, uh, the thermometer. Quoting Hopkins again in his letter from Monastrevan on the 24th of March 1889, he says, this sonnet will, f will fade, I'm afraid. Miss Cassidy's ink is, I must say, shocking. <laughs> I wonder if Miss Cassidy uh, bought Stevens' ink. <laughs> so moving on into the square, we see Scott's drapery, uh, just here, uh, which was also a lodging house which catered for seven lodgers and the staff of the drapery and the owner who all lived over the premises. You can also see Finley's, which was a hardware shop at that time, and the end of Grove House, which was the original home of the Cassidy's in, in Monastraven. Uh, every Saturday there was a market, and this is the market day in Monastraven. The surrounding farmers would come in and use their carts as uh, the stalls. But there were also fair days. The fair days, which we see here, were held on the 9th of February, the 17th and 28th of March, the 29th of April, the 16th of June, the 31st of July, the 5th of October, the 6th of November, and the 6th of De December. And to facilitate that, uh, Lord Grotta had built the market house. And not surprisingly, the market house had, had space for markets below, market stalls below. Although you can see here, a lot of the, the sellers are set, selling off the, the back of their carts or have set up, the peddlers would, would set up their own stalls and tents. <coughs> but above the market house was the courthouse. And the courthouse sat on fair days as well to prosecute anybody that was found in one of the pubs or found falling out of one of the pubs. <laughs> it might require the same today, perhaps. So, now, we're in Market Square, so let's turn around and enter Morabi through the town gate. And as we do, we pass one of the gate lodges and we naturally tip our hat to this old lady who's sit sitting outside. Uh, I have a challenge for you all. Uh, as you go out the gate to this afternoon, I want you to find that lodge house. It's still there, but it's hidden uh, under modern pebble dash and PVC windows, but you might be able to see uh, some shadow of it left. So, Morabi. Here we see Morabi in about 1890, just as Hopkins would have seen it. At that time, at the time Hopkins visited Monastrevan, the incumbent Lord Rahada was Henry Francis Seymour Moore, the third Marquis and eighth Earl of Drahada. Hopkins had written uh, the usual course on Abbey lands attends it, and it never passes down the direct line. The present Lord and Lady Drahada have no issue. There's some truth to what he writes in that the fifth Earl had inherited from his mother, Lady Loftus of Eli who had prevented her eldest son from inheriting because of his gambling debts. And it was the reason that the Drahadas had moved from Mellifont to make their main seat here in Monastreven. Uh, Henry Francis had, had inherited from his uncle at the age of 12 because his uncle had been for many years in care for a mental illness in the UK. But the Drahadas were very good landlords and great improvers, laying out the town 
uh, well enough after the domain encouraging industry and uh, by the time he came of age in 1846, he threw himself up into all the aspects of Moravi estate and the surrounding parish of Monastrevan community. Like his ancestor, he had accumulated many titles such as Lord Lieutenant of the County, Custodes, Rotolorum of the County Kildare, Vice Administrator of Leinster, uh, Honorary Colonel of the 3rd Battalion, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, Ranger of the Curra. I'm sure Hopkins would have loved all the military sounding titles. In 1846, he made extensive improvements to um, Monastrevan. The uh, wing we're actually standing in now was decorated with the portico downstairs and the sunken garden just outside the windows where he, all his doing. Uh, he was also a sportsman. Here we see some of the stage workers playing cricket, and cricket was still the major uh, sport here in in Monastrevan. The Marxists have dropped this great legacy uh, to Irish sport is however in horse ra racing. Henry Moore was one of the keenest and most influential supporters of horse racing in Ireland and England during uh, the 1800s. He was master of the Emo Hunt, he encouraged race meetings on the he Great Heat in County Leach, uh, giving a silver cup for the winners of the races. He was steward of many of the race meets around Kildare, and he founded, uh, to the eternal uh, joy and improvement of Kildare, the Punchestown race meeting, which today attracts thousands upon thousands to the race course, of course, each year. And each re running of the race, he presented to the winning jockey a white saddle cloth with red numerals. The third Marcus did indeed die without issue in 1892, and the Marcus of Drogheda ceased to exist, but the earldom passed to his cousins, the Ponsonby Moors. So now we return uh, out of Moorabbey and back onto Dublin Street, past Finley's Pub, which was at that time a hardware store. But at the back of Finley's Pub was the original site of the distillery in Monastrevan which was founded in the 70, 1700s by William Gosling. His son, John, carried on the business until his death in 1778. About this time, a land steward of Lord Drogheda by the name of Mr. John Cassidy became involved in the business, uh, ultimately taking it over from the widow of Gosling in 1784. The widow Gosling uh, uh, lived out the last of her days in a garret apartment in the house that Cassidy was now living in. By 1778, this building, which is known as the Heavy Shop, uh, replaced the earlier distillery, which had been burned down. The business continued to expand, and through an alliance with the Harveys, the famous um, um, Harveys of Bristol Cream f f uh, fame and all other distilling in Ireland, uh, which was sealed through a marriage with um, the Cassidys, they had expanded to this level. They were producing, they had in storage 7,210 7, casks of whiskey in 1787, in the second year that Hopkins was here. They employed 70 skilled workers, including the Coopers that you see here. They had 30 grey horses, which were accounted to be very fine, and the Cassidys or known for the fineness of their, their horses. And the annual output was 203,000 gallons of whiskey annually. Most of that was sold in Ireland, except for about 50,000 gallons which were exported to the USA and the UK. Uh, this is one of the posters for the distillery at the time. And you'll notice They've engaged in a little bit of propaganda here. They've exposed all the workings of the distillery so you can see how prosperous and industrial they are. And this scene wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be foreign to many of the industrial cities of the rest of Britain at the time, but quite unusual for Ireland, which was still ag largely ag agricultural. So you have the distillery here, you have the maltings here, owned by Cassidy's, but as we heard earlier, there were many more mountains, and the brewery here which produced St. Patrick's Pale Ale. Now, anybody from the town will realise that 
they have exaggerated the width of the street down here. But what they're showing is all the farmers with their carts bringing turf or grain to the distillery. Um, the farmers of the area rented <coughs> the in the bogs that Hopkins so loved from the Earl of Drogheda, where they harvest, harvested a kind of white turf which burnt very evenly and very slowly, so it was ideal for heating the pot stills which were down in this part of the distillery. Um, they also provided grain for both uh, the brewery and the distillery. But they were paid for that in turf tokens. And the turf tokens, uh, here you can see John Cassidy's name on, on one, and the other has Munstreven Distillery on it. The turf tokens allowed the Cassidys not to deal in small change and small, small amounts of cash. The farmers could go into the local shops and exchange these tokens for goods, and the shops could then exchange with Cassidys for either credit amounts or larger amounts of cash. So it was a very economic way of doing things for the Cassidys. So you'll be pleased to know we're coming to our end, the end of our look at Munstreven in Hopkins' time. But let's leave Gerd Manley Hopkins wandering out towards the town bridge and perhaps hearing the strains of Cassidy's brass band playing on the water on an evening sometime in the 1780s. And that is just the barest look at Munstreven in Hopkins' time or any other time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.